School is so much more than where you get an education as a kid. It's your whole life. It's your community. It's where you get positive feedback. It's where if you're having a bad day, hopefully a teacher notices and, you know, says an encouraging word. Um, it's your whole life. And we just took that away from them and said, what's wrong with you if you're not fine with this? If you're not fine with this, you're a selfish jerk. There's something wrong with you. Don't you care about saving lives? What's wrong with you that you care about missing school and missing prom and missing football games? There's something wrong with you. You're a bad person. So, you know, yes, we took a year, year and a half of their life, but we also told them they didn't matter. one of my favorite people. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Jennifer Say was a top executive at Levi Strauss Company before, well, she opened her yap when she shouldn't have. Uh, before we talk about the movie you've just created, which I'm so excited about, let's just revisit this. Levi Strauss is a hip, cool company. What was your sin that got you fired? I advocated for open public schools during COVID. Let me see if I got this right. So you were advocating for the overthrow of the administration. <laughs> uh, you were pushing for, for Nazis to take over the Capitol. Oh, you, the no, you, no, you just said, <laughs> we need to open up the schools. The public schools. The, public the private schools. schools were open. Yeah. Why did you feel so strongly about that? Well, a few reasons. My children, I have four children. They all go to public school and went to public school at the time. Uh, two... I know their friends and I know the cohort. I this, you know, I did this when I lived in San Francisco and I knew a lot of these children were not at home in optimal situations. And I knew how different, you know, they were maybe taking care of younger siblings. They didn't have parents at home to guide them. Um, you know, some of these kids are living in difficult situations. My kids weren't and it was still a struggle. My kids have every advantage, right? A parent at home to help, strong Wi-Fi, all of these things, plenty of food. Um, and still, the isolation and just learning online was very difficult. Um, I mean, those are the two main reasons. I don't think it took all that much imagination to understand that for a lot of children, this was really, really awful. Because what gets me so much is the, can the power of the cancel culture. That Levi Strauss, a very woke company, is happy to be out front on you know, uh, social issues, Black Lives Matter kind of issues. That's part of, that's part of who they are. But here you are, and if I remember your sin was, you tweeted. Uh, um, and how dare you do that? And you were told to shut up, basically. Yeah, Why I didn't tweeted. You? Well, I tweeted and I did some other stuff. And at first, you know, I should say when I started tweeting, I had like no followers. I was just like tweeting into the void, you know. Um, but for those of us who were willing to sort of vocally push back on the restrictions, we kind of all found each other fast on social media. There were very few who did right. so from the very beginning. So we found each other fast, and I built a sort of modest following. Um, and I ended up on the local news because at a certain point there were parents, mostly me, advocating <laughs> for right. these open schools. And I never seemed like a kook. You know, they made me, they treated me very fairly on these local news programs. You know, they didn't try to kind of position right. me as some, like, insane lunatic. Um, but I was on the local news, I wrote op-eds, and eventually was leading rallies in San Francisco in December of 2020 when schools still no, showed no sign of opening. And I also attended school board meetings and all of these things. Like, I, I wasn't just— You were just, an active mom. I wasn't just tweeting, I guess I should say. But yes, the tweets got me in trouble. Um, so but, if, if, you were, if you were leading BLM rallies— That would have been fine. You would have been okay. I believe so. That's what blows my mind with this. All right, so you were given a chance to shut up. Repeatedly over the course of two years, <laughs> I was given that chance. Because it wasn't, it was like a car crash in slow motion, honestly. I mean, or what feels now like. Because I do have other friends uh, who have been canceled and let go of their jobs and things like that. And in most instances, it's like fast. It's like they do something or some old email is uncovered from 10 years prior, which you know, right. maybe it's not quite kosher or maybe it's fine, but it's taken out of context. And, you know, 24 hours, one and done. That was not right. me. It was two years of, can you please stop? 
no thank you. Is this conversation over? Can you please stop next week? No thank you. Like it just kept going and going and going. And I kept saying, this is too important. Because the third reason I didn't stop is uh, we were talking about this a little bit before we started. I was an elite athlete as a child, a gymnast, and you know it's now been exposed that that sport is incredibly abusive. I wrote about this in a book called Chalked Up in 2008 before it was sort of known by the world. That was my first experience with being canceled. But as I look back on my own childhood and what we all endured. You blew the whistle on what was going on in gymnastics. I did. But when I think back to when I was a child, I wish that adults had stood up for me and done the right thing. And I think that is always kind of at play in my mind. That is an incredible statement. I wish adults stood up for me. That's all parents want and all kids want is an advocate. And you were an advocate for the kids. That's I, well, your I try voice to be. for them. I mean, I try to be. I, I, I don't think I sort of intended to be that, but I'm sort of like an inadvertent advocate. <laughs> and now I accept the mantle. <laughs> and I'm glad you do. <laughs> Just one last question on this one. Um, you, you walked away from some serious money. Yeah. Why? I mean, do you yeah, want to I mean, talk people... a little bit about how much money did you lose by agreeing to be pushed out of Levi yeah. just because you're standing up for kids? Well, I think, you know, I was offered in, in, in January of 22, I was told that there wouldn't be a place for me at the company anymore. And of course, was as an executive offered severance to walk away quietly, essentially hush money, which is pretty standard in a corporation. Um, I decided. Well, with a non disclosure, just let me jump this. Well, yeah, you have if, to sign if, a non disclosure. If you sign this and you don't talk about what we did right. to push you out, or the terms of the departure. Yeah. Um, because as they've been fond of saying, we couldn't have stopped her from talking about the need for open schools. And I'm like, well, yeah, of course you couldn't have. That's not what the non-disclosure would be. The non-disclosure would be about the terms of the departure. So I didn't want to sign that uh, because I felt it was important to sound the alarm about the censorship and the illiberalism happening in, in, in corporate woke culture. Corporate culture. Yeah. This is a woke, this is a woke company. And I always thought are. free speech was yeah, I guess you're right. Most are. But you'd think free speech is an important thing or to be an advocate for underrepresented kids would be something. No. Well, everything was... How much did you walk away from? Upside what down. Was, what were they it? offering you to, in hush money? It was over a million dollars. Oh, my God. But I think the more um, startling number is what I would have made as CEO. And you were on track for that. Yes. I was the leading candidate. To be Levi's CEO. Yeah. It would have been awesome. What what would you be making now as, as Well, CEO? the woman who they hired to replace me made $20 million in her first year on the job as president, which was my replacement, which, lest you be too jealous, is more than I made in 23 years combined at the company. So, <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just flabbergasted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's why I don't buy Levi's anymore. All right. You are so taken by this. You became a celebrity for standing up, <laughs> not just for the kids, but also standing up against the cancel culture. And to, to, to be able to stand up and say, oh, I took a million dollars, I'm not going to take it so that I can talk about cancel culture. So many people are feeling that in their jobs everywhere. They've got to say things they don't want to say. They've got to use pronouns they don't want to use. Yeah. They have to take classes that they don't want to. They have to say certain things and stay in a box or be canceled. Yeah. I, mean, I, I wrote that there were two sexes, not two genders, and I got fired from the Denver Post for that. You know, I, people know about this. Yeah. And so you become a, a real celebrity and a, someone people look up to and say, look, it, it, it happens here too, but she's speaking well, up against, about it. Well, it doesn't stop until we say so. Honestly, if not you, then who? You have to do it. And, you know, I think if we take this issue of, of schools, the thing that I sort of felt so strongly about, which is, you know, children need to be in school. I mean, it's a legally required thing, right? And Zoom school is not school. I felt very strongly this needed to happen. The social censorship, the real censorship of voices being sort of deplatformed or blacklisted, um, the media sort of failing or refusing to include a diversity of voices on the subject. Um, there was a 
consensus that was manufactured, there never was agreement amongst on experts right. on COVID and the need to close schools or to lock down or the effectiveness of that. It was a that. propaganda campaign. Yes. And people who didn't go along with it were canceled. They were. But if enough of us had stood up, I stand by this, if enough of us had stood up and said no and pushed back and come to the rallies, they can't cancel everyone. They can't cancel everyone. And when I think about the fact that the day after I resigned very publicly from Levi's, the very next day, three members of the San Francisco school board were, um, were recalled, but in a crushing majority, 70, 75% of the people that voted. Those people all agreed with me. Yeah. Imagine if they'd all stood up and stood with me and come to the rallies. They did it privately in the ballot box, but they were too afraid for all the reasons we have discussed. Well, this is the same thing. I've, I've thought a lot about the Bud Light boycott. Yeah. Why is it that businesses get away with, with all this stuff? And for a relatively minor political infraction, they were just trying to, Bud Light's just trying to advertise to a new uh, category of people. They want to be customers. The backlash was so out of control compared to the sin. And then you think about it, no, because it's one of the rare times you can be anonymous about, so mm. no, I'm not going along with this woke stuff. I'm not going along with the pronouns. So instead of reaching for Bud Light, you reach for Coors or Modella. But, yeah. And, and you get to do it anonymously. It's, in the voting booth. Uh, uh, is anonymous. In the voting booth was anonymous. Yeah. I think the Bud Light situation is an interesting one. I think there's a few factors in terms of why that one stuck. Because corporate boycotts don't usually stick from either did, side. Why do you think it stuck? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. One, I think it's not just rejection. It's it's not a sort of rejection of trans people or anti-trans. It's a rejection of an ideology that dictates how we speak and that demands that we say there are not two sexes, biology isn't real. That, Science isn't that real. That sex is assigned at birth rather than just obvious. <laughs> like, it's a rejection of that ideology. That's the first part. Mulvaney was just a representation of that, a proxy for that ideology. It's a rejection of that and the sort of coercion in forcing us to all go along. Um, the idea that I don't know what a woman is because I'm not a biologist. I mean, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I know what a cat is. I know what a dog is. <laughs> I don't need to be a doctor to know what a woman is. So people are rejecting that out of pocket. I think when you look at the Bud Light brand, to your point, there's plenty of other options. It's not a particularly great product. It's not a differentiated product. So I can just as easily, if that's what I usually drink, find something just as cheap and just as not that tasty. I'm going to disagree with you on that, in that next to cigarettes, I think beer probably has the highest brand loyalty of any consumable. That, you know, you, you know this is, I grew, drank this growing up, this is my beer, this is, and that's what I, I smoke Marlboros or whatever it is, that's what I smoke until it kills me. And so for someone to grab, uh, let's go with Modella or Coors Light instead, I think, choice. I think it's a bigger, it wasn't, it wasn't like paper plates or, you know, yeah, something else. Yeah, it's not else. as the, the, commodified as is, that. It has wild brand loyalty. Yeah, it does. I would argue the brand loyalty is driven by, for Bud Light in particular, the brand message, which has been funny and it's about, and they lost all that. Where yeah. was the fun and where was the humor? And so they weren't living up to kind of what the consumer expected. Also, it was a working guy's brew. Yeah, and all of a sudden they're just not true to the brand anymore because the product itself isn't differentiated from Coors Light or Miller's Light or Modelo. I mean, I don't drink this kind of beer. Well, but as a Coors drinker, no, I can taste the difference. You can. Absolutely. Well, okay. All right. Let's we'll, just, we'll the, keep going on it. We'll keep going. So I think that made it easy to switch. You could easily find something as cheap and sort of comparable. But they broke loyalty. They because did. Because they, they, want, had they enough. needed an outlet. They had and it enough. Would, it had to be anonymous. You weren't anonymous. All right. Let's, let, I want to keep rolling. Other boycotts, though, haven't stuck. And there have been, you know, other brands. Oh, the other thing I was going to say, the third part that yeah. matters is it's a, it's a broad reach, huge, for everyone brand. There are brands that are more niche that can go this route, and it's fine because they're catering to a very specific audience right. that says, I vote for those val values, too. I think what we're going to see is these big, broad reach brands are going to quietly start to kind of back away from this kind of thing. I can only 
hope so. I believe you will. I think it will take a while. Getting back to COVID. As you know, I've got a son who has Down syndrome. And school is crucial for him. It's his interaction. It's how he socializes. It's where he learns. I'm not talking about the learning ABC stuff. It is interacting with his peers. It is interacting with the teachers. And it's... It has to be in person. They have to move them sometimes. Uh, you know, there's, it's a yeah. physical thing. Yeah. And to watch my son on Zoom classes, it was more than insulting. He regressed. Yeah. He cannot, you know, it's just a screen with faces yapping at him. And the times I could tell you that he just put his head down on the table and paid no attention. Yeah. No, there was nothing there for him. Yeah. And I sued. I grabbed a lawyer. I said, this is a violation of the Individuals with Disabilities Education yeah. Act. I said, you are denying him a free and appropriate education. education. And we lost. I and what was believe. the rationale? The rationale was uh, he got a good enough education. Mm. That he, he, we didn't prove that he regressed enough. We had, I know him. I know yeah. him better than people like anyone. Men. Yeah. You know, the people who live with him. But the school board hired all the experts to say, oh, he's, he's fine. fine. He's, yeah. he's fine. You wouldn't know. And, you know, I think about it when I sued, and I'm a mouthy guy, and I, all those families who don't have the comfort that I have, I'm not yeah. going to lose my job doing right. this. It, I, I, the English as a second language families who had special needs kids yeah. who were robbed of a year yeah. of their lives and regressed and can never get it back. And that's just one little piece yeah. compared to all the other kids. But it's a big piece. It's an important piece. And I know we're going to talk about the film, but I'll leap right to it. I am making Please. a documentary now called Generation COVID. And we've been following children and families across the country uh, for about a year and a half to understand the impacts to a range of kids. So we're trying to hit on all the kind of different things that happen, the learning loss, kids that dropped out. We do have a Downs child in Oregon. Um, she is, I think she was in first grade when it started. Um, so it, you know, it lasted two years, so third grade by the end of that. Um, and since for kids like mine, kids like that, pardon me for jumping in, because they're developmentally delayed and they learn on such a slow scale, <clears throat> missing a year yeah. might as well be missing five years. Well, yeah, I mean, this this child, her name is Lizzie, um, and her mother speaks a lot in the film about exactly what you're saying. The value of school for Lizzie is she learns how to put her coat on and zip her coat up. She learns how to go to the cafeteria and sit with the other kids and get her own food. She learns how to tie her shoes. I mean, this is a first grader with Down right. syndrome we're talking about, right? So she learns how to be social and interact with people because the hope for this child is that she can grow up and, I mean, obviously there's a broad spectrum of That she can be part develop, of that she could society. Be, that she could be part of society. And while she might not be able to live on her own, she could live in a place with other adults like her. She could hold a job. She could interact. She could be happy. She could have a life outside of the four walls of her home. And one of the things her mom also talked about was, you know, her communication skills are obviously not as developed as another six or seven-year-old. Yep. And so... She was just so frustrated all the time. She couldn't explain. She didn't understand why she wasn't with her friends. And she couldn't explain to people that she was lonely. And she just fell apart. Even when school started, my son Chance uh, had to wear a mask, which he does not like wearing. It's hard for him to breathe yeah. through. Uh, and the teachers had to wear masks. Yeah. Now we find out what good, yeah, no good none. those did. And for him, in order to understand him, you need to see his facial expressions. Right. In order, since he's hard of hearing, in order for him to understand what you're saying, he needs to see your face. Right. He needs to see your expressions right. and how you say things. So even for a year and a half, two years after that, know what was he going. was denied an education along yeah. with all the other kids who are there in their little uh, ice boxes by their desks. Well, uh, for Lizzie in this community outside of, just outside of Portland, Um, The parents, including Lizzie's parents, advocated for, well, they advocated for all children to go back, but the school district allowed for those who had these developmental disabilities to go back first, a little bit earlier. Wow. So, yes, but what that meant was Lizzie went back to school alone. Right. 
So she was in the classroom alone with a teacher, with a mask and a face shield. Um, for all the reasons you just described, she struggled with wearing a mask, not to mention there's physical limitations. Yeah. The nose is softer, the ears my son, my won't son hold has the a mask. deformed ear and he can't, he can't hold on same to the thing. mask. Same um, thing. Tongue is a little bit bigger and doesn't have control. She'd come home and it was soaking wet. She's trying to learn to speak. She needs to see expressions and, and learn from those cues. But on top of that, she was lonely at school. To her, school was a place where she went to see her friends. And so the behavioral issues persisted even after she was in school alone. And she's just now, you know, we're three years how many years out are we? I can't even count anymore. Um, we're about three years out, and she's just still kind of struggling to get back on track, you know? And they're hoping she actually learns to read. And Why did you want to make a movie about the impacts of stealing people, kids' education for that year, that be, missing year? Why, be, what's the passion on that? Because it's so, well, one, I knew it would be memory hold. I knew it was going to be catastrophic from day one, which is why I wouldn't stop talking about it. And I couldn't believe that people weren't seeing it. And it was so, you know, I was being screamed at that I was a racist, right? Because if I advocated you for a public people. school, I want to kill black you people. You want to kill people. Oh, black yeah, children. A, I didn't know that. Yeah, because they're the sort of ones disproportionately in attendance of urban public schools, which is which is true. Um, the exact opposite, in fact, was true. Um, yes, Black children, you know, I'll talk about the schools in San Francisco, the low-income children, 50%, 60% of the public school population. So the most vulnerable children, the toughest kind of home situations. And it's not to say their parents are neglectful. I'm not arguing that at all. But these are parents working hourly wage jobs, possibly night shift. These kids are just left home alone because the parents are trying to put food on the table. Um, the, it was terrible. Kids didn't have food. They didn't have adults to help them. They didn't have social services that they need. All of these things that they get in They school. were under house arrest. They were under house without arrest. Without committing oh, a crime. They also, they couldn't, there were no playgrounds. There were no youth sports. Even after public schools were reinstated, they didn't start youth sports for another year or so. So anyway, I didn't want it to get memory hold. And it already is. I have people telling me all the time, I don't know why you're still on about this. Schools were closed for like three weeks. Oh my Lord. A moron. I, I don't understand who would say this. So that's the first thing. Schools in California were closed for close to 20 months. And you now see it's all unfolding exactly as I predicted. So you have the New York Times announcing the startling evidence of the harms of school closures. There's nothing startling. I'm quoting them directly. There's nothing startling about this evidence. It's right. exactly as we would have predicted. And you have every key player that played a pivotal role in keeping the schools closed. So that's governors like Gavin Newsom. That's union heads like Randy Weingarten. That is the CDC leaders like Rochelle Walensky, all saying, well, I had nothing to do with it. It was that you person. You had everything to They're do with it. They're all like this. They all used the other for plausible deniability. So, um, you know, the CC CDC says, and, and Fauci say, it's ill-advised. You need to hit these sort of metrics to open schools, which are unreachable. Um, but they don't say you have to. They're, you know, it's guidelines. So then Gavin says then he's following local, the guidelines. And, you have and then local. you have local. Everyone's following guidelines. And the local folks are scared because they don't want to get sued. And That's so right. they just go, well, we're just Everyone's following, following guidelines. the science. That's right. So the local public health says they're following the CDC guidelines. The gu CDC says it's just guidelines. Gavin says I'm following the CDC guidelines. Everybody's like this, right? And then my favorite um, accountable party is the press, who doesn't interrogate any of the issues, any of the guidelines, they just print the CDC's talking points and big pharma press releases as if they're fact. So nobody does their job, and it's the kids who suffered for it. And I want to tell their stories, and I want people to hear it from the mouths of the children themselves, because the kids are the ones that haven't had a voice. The press was an interesting one for me, because this was the first time the press felt relevant since 9-11. And they weren't just giving you the news. Damn it, they were saving lives. Right. So they took the scares, they took the propaganda, and they went out full force. There was no investigation, there was no fact checking, there was no, because they've, I've, I've never seen them so smug and so, smug. so pompous because they are saving lives, finally. The that's job why, has meaning. That's why, for me, it's so enraging that the New York Times has the audacity to publish, 
I know it's an op-ed. It's not the science desk, but it should be the science desk to publish an op-ed a couple weeks ago talking about the startling evidence of the harms of the school closures. Because like I said, there's nothing startling about it. And you if a normie- You made it happen. You, if, if, the they contributed of government, to if the fourth branch of government- That's right. Did their job. This wouldn't have happened. Job, this wouldn't have happened. They would have been called on their BS. That's right. And we wouldn't, they didn't kids do, wouldn't be hurt. They didn't do anything. And that is why I hold a special disdain <laughs> at this point for the mainstream press. And it is why I feel no sense of relief um, or redemption when they publish garbage like that. It just makes me all the more mad. How many times did you hear something like this? And I think this was part of the positive side. So my older daughter was in high school and she had online classes. And she would always tell me about how they would propagandize in class, how mm. they'd push uh, uh, critical race theory and this and that. So I'm listening into her classes now. And we learned about about uh, racism in her, her social studies class. We learned about critical race theory in her math class. <laughs> and then in her yoga class, the teacher was going on <laughs> about critical race theory and how uh, the systematic, uh, systematic racism in a yoga class. An online yoga an class. An online <laughs> yoga class. And so finally, parents like me got the confirmation of what we thought was going on in a lot of these classes, the, the brainwashing and indoctrination that goes on. And finally, we heard it first hand. And my poor daughter's like, no, no, you're not going on to this class. No, you're not speaking up. This, you, I need to pass this class. You're not coming on because I could barely hold my uh, self from doing it. The other thing that I noticed was she learned how to game the system pretty oh, well. Yeah. Let me tell you, she knew how to pop on the camera, go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. and ask a question, and then go back to yeah. watching TikTok or whatever it was for an hour. Yeah, there's a few stories um, in parents in the film It's talking about how they realized their kids were not doing anything. anything. Um, they'd have, like, more than one screen set up. You know, they'd be watching Netflix on their phone with the, you know, camera off, but the screen on, yeah. and they'd listen to do just what you described. Right. Um, and... For many families, until they started seeing failing grades, they had no idea. And that even took, a, you know, in some instances, that was pretty difficult to achieve failing grades because they went to pass fail. <laughs> so you really, you know, you really had to screw it up. We took away a year of education. Not only did that, but we, we isolated kids. That's I right. looked at this and I said, this is going to do mental harm. That this it is did. going to cause depression. This is going to cause suicide. It's going to cause violence and mass shootings years later because these kids are not in the places where they can get help uh, at the most vulnerable time in their life where peer structure is so important. They had no peers. Yeah. They had no teachers to go, I think this kid's in trouble. Maybe we should get them help. Right. It, well, and as one mom in the film and this family in Oakland said, school is so much more than where you get an education as a kid. It's your whole life. It's your community. It's where you get positive feedback. It's where if you're having a bad day, hopefully a teacher notices and, you know, says an encouraging word. Um, it's your whole life. And we just took that away from them and said, what's wrong with you if you're not fine with this? If you're not fine with this, you're a selfish jerk. There's something wrong with you. Don't you care about saving lives? What's wrong with you that you care about missing school and missing prom and missing football games? There's something wrong with you. You're a bad person. So, you know, yes, we took a year, year and a half of their life, but we also told them they didn't matter, which I think is really the most devastating thing. They felt that and... Think about the ongoing harm that that creates. And what we're seeing now. That's what right. What we're seeing now. It's completely look, look. expected. We go back to the racist part because uh, I consider us friends and I, I know you're quite the white supremacist and uh, I saw you at the rallies uh, with the, the last cross burning. The, that part really just bothers me so much that people were so scared, so freaked out, so played by the media yeah. and by the government uh, that they were in such a frenzy that if you disagreed, yeah. you were a killer and you were racist. Yeah. How, how to say, uh, no, this is a bad policy, makes you a racist. Yeah. And the height of cancel culture there, that just to disagree, 
to dissent, yeah. to have a contrary opinion, to go into the world where we where we talk about these things in the in the in the town square or whatever version yeah. we want to do. You are now not just the uh, faithful opposition; you're a killing racist set out on genocide for that tweet. Yeah. Or that or saying you know that report yeah. doesn't actually say what you think it says. Yeah. Yeah, and at first it bothered me, you know, to be called, let's see, all the names were racist, eugenicist, anti-vaxxer, anti-masker, anti-trans that wove its way in even to COVID because if you're anti, you're anti-everything. QAnon, which I had to look up, I'd never heard of it at the time, so I had to look that up and I was like, are there really any people that think these things? Apparently there are, and I've met one. Um, I don't know, the list, uh, a a Christo-fascist, Christo fascist? Yeah, I had to look that one up. It's a strange thing to call a nice Jewish girl from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Christian fascist. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, I'm a Christian nationalist. The, the, anyway, but you know what? Here's what I realized. At first, when the names came at me, I tried. I did try to defend myself because these are terrible names. You get branded as a racist, you don't really get to have a job. Right, you don't. And you know what? If you really are one, if you're really a horrible, like, clan card carrying member like you probably shouldn't get to be the president of Levi's I mean honestly right like if those are your real honest beliefs I get it um so branding a person that way is harmful and it dangerous it, it goes back to centuries old thousands year old a way to keep societies in line which is shaming that's right the power and- of shaming has never has never gone away and so many people are scared to share their opinion yes, for the is, shame that comes from that being is, called a racist. Th- and it's not just shame, the consequences, because it really is a mark on your reputation. You know, nobody wants to have a racist as the leader of any organization, I mean, unless it's a clan, Listen, yeah. <laughs> then that's good. Um, and so at first I tried to defend myself and I would try to explain why I'm not any of these things. And then I realized that was pointless. Yeah. You can't. And um, what I tell people now it's the, you know, slinging those names, it's the, it's the purview of those with no argument. Because no one ever engaged me on the merits of the, the things that I was saying. And so now I laugh at it. Now it makes me laugh. Like every new name makes me laugh. So people like us who have been through the fire of all this, when we get called racist, it, yeah. means, it means we're doing something right. Because they have no other argument. Yeah. And when they're attacking and telling you how awful you are personally, it means... All right, must be over over target, but that's not the way most Americans I know. are. They just want to have a I nice know. life. They want to get along. They don't want to get yelled at at the grocery store. They don't want to get pointed at and go, "That person's a weirdo." She she wanted to kill people during yeah. COVID. I know, and this is not for everyone, you know, <laughs> but to stand is, up and say these things. But there was a time. There was but, a time that the left were the ones that said... Well, that's why I was of the left. Mm-hmm. The left were the... I, I viewed the left, you're going to laugh at me, but you shouldn't, as, you know, the the party or the cohort that cared about public schools and believed in inclusivity and, you know, respected difference and believed in free speech and stood up for the little guy. That's what they said they cared about. Now, whether they ever did or not, we can debate that. That's not the point. You'll agree with me, they, that was the image they presented. I'll go a little further. It was the left that was principled. I will defend to my death your right to say it, yeah. even if I disagree. It's you know, the ends don't justify the means. You're innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. Those principles from, are now gone from the left. I agree. That's you why are I'm going not... to get banned first. We're yep. going to destroy your ability to make a living if you don't toe the party line. And the party line with COVID was Black and white. You go yep. along with the scare tactics. Yes. You stay home forever to be a good person. Never mind the fact that unpleasant sort of fact that that was not feasible for most of the population. And those who were in terrible home situations or abusive situations. Women were abused. Children were abused. Women had to pull out of the workforce and, you know, insane numbers to take home and, you know, to stay home and deal with homeschooling. Kids weren't getting the food they needed. They weren't getting the psychological counseling that they needed. Now you can say, and I get attacked for this, the schools shouldn't provide that anyway and everyone should homeschool their kids. But that's not realistic. It's just not a a realist. And you certainly can't force people to do that overnight. 
not not do it well. If this were to raise its head again, let's say the next pandemic well, happens, it, it could. It, what what will be different or won't be different? In other words, will we act the same way at the next pandemic? Well, I think the numbers have grown. You know, I mean, I have a lot numbers of, of what the numbers of people now who are willing to stand up and say, "Yeah, no, that we're not doing that again." <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, you know, so there's a lot of people that I know who perhaps were on board. And most, here's what I'll say. Most of the families that we feature in the film say they were fine for the first two or three months. They washed their, you know, they they bleached the (laughs) grocery bags. I never did any of this, but they did that. They wore the masks and they stayed home to stay safe. And then they're three months in and they're realizing, wow, my child is really suffering. And then they start to dig in and they start to learn that children are at little to no risk um, and that the schools in Denmark opened after three weeks and they learn and they learn. So you have this much larger cohort of people now who would be willing to stand up and say, hell no. That said, it's one of the reasons I want to, I am making this film is we need widespread acceptance it needs to be like logged on the board that this was a catastrophic failure and we can never do it again. It was not only ineffective, but incredibly harmful and wrong. And it needs to be chronicled. That's right. There was a time when the press would chronicle these things and look back at it and say, here's what we did wrong. I'm not seeing that. Not bad no, here, it's, it's not, not that. It's not. To have a record yep. of the damage. I agree. Let me throw this and one. Na- and accountability. There were actual people. Yeah, nobody, nobody paid a price for this. Yeah, it's like we say, oh, yes, learning loss is bad. Who did it? Somebody did that. It was a policy choice. It was a terrible one. It was a moral atrocity. It was ineffective and incredibly harmful. People made these decisions. People like Gavin Newsom and Rochelle Walensky and Tony Fauci. And, and on, Jared and, Polis here in Colorado. Uh, yep, and you know, on and on. Yep. Yeah. Um, Beyond that, there's a fiscal and monetary side to this that is yet to play out when the government creates double the uh, money supply, prints yeah. it off the presses, yeah. and just gives it to the people like... And no one talks about nobody it. Nobody talks about as it. It's this like, being here's the reason. funny money, we'll just pass it yep. to the states. Yeah, we'll double the size of our money supply. Yeah. Well, and the, now the we're like... The long-term impacts, not just the short-term inflation we have, but the fact that our money has doubled... And we're, now more people are addicted to government spending, addicted to being on welfare, addicted to, to having these handouts because we just print up the money and it goes. And it always works until it doesn't. Right. Well, and yes, to all of that. And you can't shut the world's economy down, the world's supply chain down, and not think there are going to be grave impacts. People are going to starve. That is what is happening and has happened in third world countries. People are going to starve. The impacts of it are way worse than COVID, which they would have gotten a cold and moved on. But we literally prevented these people from getting necessary food and medicine. And then we shut down the supply chain. So there was no supply. Then we gave out money. So there was a lot of demand. It's, <laughs> like all it's, all, it's all screwed up and upside down and backwards. And even now, as we talk about inflation and this sort of in the current moment and in the near term, I still feel like no one kind of goes back and attributes it to the fact that all that stuff I just said, right? right. You double double no. money supply, your money's worth half as much. Right. Let me throw this one at you. Maybe this is a good way to wrap it up as well. This is going to sound weird. I never understood how human beings could put other human beings into cattle cars. You read about it. Yeah. You read about uh, um, what happened you know, Nazi Germany, the craziness, you know, that wouldn't happen. I wouldn't do it. This wouldn't happen. But when I saw the fear from COVID, the manufactured fear from COVID, and how people complied without question, yeah. all across the, the political board, we had conservatives, you know, the government says this, this oh, big, yeah. we're gonna, and they were scared. And when you're scared, you start worrying. And then they start narking on their neighbors. They're having more people over. They're doing this. They're doing that. And you're turning in your your neighbors to the state because you're scared. Now, we didn't have hunger. We didn't have an enemy. Bullets weren't flying. We weren't being invaded. We weren't having a massive depression. There was not a financial upheaval. And still, people just stood in lines at 
well, we're closing down the churches, synagogues, and mosques. I, I guess that's okay. Our First Amendment right to, to worship. gather and worship, that, that's gone, but that's okay. I talked to a, a person I knew at the ACLU, and I said, you want to do something about this? Because, and the response is, well, we're just following the science now. Yeah. As if the First Amendment is canceled during a pandemic. So let me ask you about the fear. What yeah. we forget is that when people are scared, yeah. they are easily misled and, mid and quarantined and yeah. told what to do, and they fall in line when they're scared about something that was relatively nothing in the big scheme. When it turns into something, the next depression, which will happen, uh, and a next war, a next real pandemic, what, kind of, what can they get away with? Yeah, a lot. Um, I mean, I would argue, I think you would agree with me, even if it is a much more deadly virus, I don't think the government has the right to tell us we can't worship or gather. I think in that instance, people will protect themselves because there's real actual risk, they didn't do or it. they, they won't. didn't do it this time. The ACLU didn't stand up for them, and they stayed away, and they obeyed. Yeah. They stayed well, away and it from... also was worthless. It's like it didn't actually do anything anyway. It trying to stop a sort of you know airborne <laughs> virus. It's like trying to stop air. I mean, there is just sort of a we can't accept bad things might happen, and that there's nothing we can do about it. Sometimes, um, but the fact of the matter is, everybody's had COVID more than one time at this point. None of it done did anything. Some people have had. Let's be honest. Some people have had long lasting. <laughs> reactions to it. People die from COVID. Oh, there, I, yeah. there are people who have called long COVID or whatever. I've known people who have who've really been hurt by COVID. But the people that they destroyed their lives from, the kids who were under basically no risk statistically. Yeah. And I, I just not letting them go to school didn't protect them from COVID. They were, right. so it all just made no sense. None of this worked. It was like, you know, you stay home, it's like stepping on a garden hose. The minute you take your foot off, the water's gonna come out anyway. So it didn't prevent COVID from spreading. It didn't prevent anybody from getting COVID. That was gonna happen anyway. And by the way, we caused a generation of kids to, you know, miss out on learning, believe they don't matter, their learning doesn't matter, suffer from isolation and other mental health impacts, drug addiction, suicide, uh, developmental challenges, on and on and on, and they're still suffering from it. And that's why we call the film Generation COVID. I've seen parts of the movie as you're putting it together, and you have a great sizzle reel. Where can people watch that, by the way? If you go to YouTube, our, we, have a, um, we have a YouTube channel, that's what it's called. That's what it's called. Um, at Generation dash COVID, and we have a trailer there. And ours, of course, at IITV. We'll try to see if we can oh, link awesome. to it here as well. Final question. You get it out, people watch it, someone watches it. What do you want them to do differently? What's what's the goal? This is a, you just spend a year and a half of your life putting together this yeah, movie. Yeah, it'll be two and a half years by the time it's done, probably, yeah. or two full years. Well, our goal is to have everybody watch it. You know, we don't want to just preach to the choir. We don't want to just speak to those who, you know, already see the harms done. I want everyone to look at the evidence, hear from these children and these families themselves, and hopefully understand the impact of what was done and be motivated to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And hopefully help these kids get back on track in their own communities. Because it is still possible to help these children get on on track, but nothing's being done to do so. It's got to be fun to be a director of a movie. And by the way, the casting was incredible. How you got Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> to to play Fauci was <laughs> remarkable. Uh, in a documentary, no. <laughs> yeah, in a doc it was just incredible. <laughs> Jennifer, I think you're a hero for doing this. And uh, please just keep doing it Thanks. and keep doing it. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Always. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.